Hey guys, it's uh, Marshall with you again, and uh, today I'm going to do a uh, video about the Legends Quest plugin, uh, version 1.82. Uh, this video is going to be um, the, some information about the changes that, are, that have happened in version 1.82, and I also thought it would be useful to demonstrate some of the features that I didn't really get into in a whole lot of detail um, in the video series about the previous versions of the Legends Quest plugin, um, specifically with deeds and collections, things like that. So this video is going to be uh, kind of uh, a combination of uh, demonstrating some of the old features that we really didn't talk about before too much, and the uh, new features that are in this version of the of the plugin. Uh, of course, most obvious is the uh, is the numerous bug fixes that uh, that went into this version. So uh, it's it's I find it's running a lot. Um, more stable these days than it than it has in the past. So uh, what I'm going to do is get started uh, by telling you what I have here. Uh, I've got a simple little test module. I've got pretty much everything that I'm going to use already installed on it, which I'm going to go through in a moment. Um, but I do have this one area in here called Rocky Beach. I downloaded from the vault. Uh, it's a, it looks like a fantastic area um, created by Zarconis, I believe his name is. And uh, it's available on the vault. It looks uh, looks really good, and it's going to fit in uh, perfectly for what I want to demonstrate today. So uh, that's the area that we've got in here, and then we've got all the resources for the various Legends plugins that I have installed in this one. Now, I have several plugins installed in this module together because I want to use them in some of the quests that I want to demonstrate um, today. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is fire up our master configurator here. And again, this is the master configurator version 1.82, so it looks a little different from the old one. Um, and we're going to go into the configure, and I've already got this all set up and configured, so it, nothing has really changed there. Um, all the rules and information in the documentation still kind of apply, uh, so have a look at that to find out what all this means. Uh, or go back and look at the previous videos to, to learn more about what this means, but I'm just going to quickly go through what's changed. Uh, again, the, the module, the update module scripts and update area scripts have been moved out of, uh, out of here and moved on to the main screen. Um, but uh, what I've got going here is I've got the Legends Loot plugin uh, active, the Info plugin, the AI plugin, the Banter plugin, the Quest plugin, the Spawn plugin. Now these are, these are okay to do, this is, this is alright to do, even if you don't use your AI plugin uh, or the Legends AI plugin for your regular creatures, even if you don't use the spawn plugin for your regular spawning, uh, things like that. That's okay to actually still go ahead and install these because um, the quest plugin becomes more powerful when you have them and it's only going to make changes to the things that are related to quests. So um, if your regular monsters that are in you know, your field of orcs or whatever you know, use your own AI, use your own spawning system, that's okay. Go ahead, continue doing that. This, this spawn plugin should not interfere with yours at all, um, and that's kind of the the by design. You know, you should be able to install most of these things without impacting your existing stuff. Uh, and I can show you how that happens. Uh, the first most important thing is all the scripts are named uniquely based on the uh, plugin, and uh, most of the scripts that it it does override, uh, if any, are basically built-in ones anyway. So very very little conflict. But I have all these installed because I want to demonstrate various components of the quest, of what questing can do uh, when you combine them with other plugins. So I've already connected to a database, it's all set up, so I'm just finishing this. Uh, again, update your module scripts once you have, if you install any new plugins, always update your module scripts. And of course, if you have never uh, updated your area scripts, you'll want to do that. You can either use this button or do it manually. So this button puts in a client enter script and a client exit script in all your areas in the module. Now if you have a lot of areas that can take some time, but because it has to open up each module, uh, each area and update its scripts and then close and save the area. Now right away, and I've been through this before, but I'm going to quickly go through it again. A lot of people are um, iffy about using that button because they have client enter and client exit scripts already in their modules. So I'm going to go through I'm going to just take a moment to show what exactly that button does. So here we have the area open, and I'm going to bring over that area's properties. I'm going to scroll down to the uh, on client enter and on exit script. Uh, what it'll do, what, the, what, what pressing that button does to each area is it opens it up and it checks to see what's actually here. If there's nothing here, 
it'll simply put this script in. No conflict, everything's great. Uh, if there's nothing here, it does the same thing, it just puts this script in, so great. However, the question comes in when I do have a script here and I do have a script here. That should not be a problem, because what it'll do is it'll actually notice that you have a script in here and notice that you have a script in here. And what it'll do is it'll actually copy your script. It'll Whatever this is, it'll make a copy of it. And the new copy will have a new file name. The new name will begin with LG underscore. And what it'll do is it'll modify that copy and insert what it needs to insert into your script without touching the rest of it. So I've, I've you know, there's a lot of people who are doing this and I've yet to hear any issues with, uh, with, with a conflict uh, by doing that, so it's it's a fairly safe thing to do. Um, I have had some people using um, some uh, framework where it prioritizes scripts. I can't remember what it's called, but some framework or whatever. It doesn't matter if you don't want to use the button and update these scripts. That's okay too. What's important is that these scripts are being called in these events. Now, how you do that? You know, you can either put the scripts in here, you can modify your scripts, you can use the button, you can use your framework that calls scripts, whatever. Whatever is important, and, and it seemed to be a common theme, that things don't work because people are forgetting about these two scripts. They have to be in the areas, in all your areas, or things just won't work right. So that's important, and I thought that was important enough to stop uh, for. So we'll move along. Uh, and I'll just put that back. So... And again, that's all documented too in the documentation about those two events that have to be uh, have to be there. Uh, and and again, and again, the same thing happens with the module scripts too. The the same same information has to apply to the module scripts, and all the scripts that are changed are actually in the 182 documentation too. So you so you'll know about that. Uh, so yeah, that's the uh, that's the master configurator. And the next thing we're going to go is uh, look at the actual Quest plugin configuration itself. So we'll fire up the new Quest plugin, and we'll fire up the configure. And you'll see that there's some changes in here since the previous versions. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm not going to go through again because uh, it, it's all still the same as the old videos, but uh, I'll just go through the new stuff. Uh, the first new thing is this checkbox here, Quest Items No Drop. What this means is that when you create a quest or edit a quest, um, the quest items that are involved in that quest. If you check this on, they'll become no drop, so players can't drop them and, and you know pass them around and things like that. Um, what else is also important is that in the older versions, pre 1.8 versions, the quest plugin never actually checked uh, a player's inventory to see if they had items uh, belonging to a quest. So you know if a quest giver said, yeah, "I need you know to go out and get this missing necklace or whatever." And you had that quest, and you know there's a missing necklace blueprint in in your uh, in your module. You could a player could actually have that miss find that missing necklace, give it to another player, and go turn in the quest without actually having it in their inventory. It was just the fact that they managed to collect it was all that was important. That's changed uh, since 1.8. Now you actually have to have the items in your inventory. If if the items are not in your inventory, regardless of what your journal says, you have to have the items in your inventory. So you can do that. You know, you can force that by having them no drop, or you can just not do this at all, and it doesn't matter if the player goes out, collects the missing necklace, drops it, gives it to another player, and tries to turn a quest in. Your journal may say you still have it, but if it's not in your inventory, you won't be able to complete the quest, and it'll actually pop up a little message saying you don't have all the required items. So that's that's now a non-issue anymore. Uh, however, I put this option in here because in my persistent world. I like to make my quest items no drop, so it's just an option you can turn it on or off. Uh, some new things here. Now, um, the, I'll, I'll go through these two bottom ones here first. Add quest to new blueprints and add quest to existing blueprints. What this does is um, whenever you're creating new items or placeables or creatures uh, or editing a quest that has um, creatures or items or placeables in it, uh, what'll happen is if these are on, uh, the word quest in curly brackets will appear after the name. Now you don't see the word quest in game because of the Neverwinter Nights 2 you know, curly bracket thing where it's just a comment and not actually displayed. Uh, so that's that's what these will do. So it kind of helps you identify what items and placeables in your blueprints list may be related to the quest. These two, these are two new organizational options. Uh, I've had this requested of me and I was I was kind of wondering how I was going to go about doing this because there, it does, there is an issue with this and I'm going to describe what it is. Uh, with these on, what happens is 
your blueprints get reorganized whenever you go in and edit a quest and hit finish or create a new quest and the blueprints that are involved creatures placeables items they'll actually get organized in a um, by quest name so in your blueprints you'll see you know legends quest category you will pop that open and what you'll see is like things like quest NPCs and you'll pop that open and all the names of the quests will be listed there and you open up the quest name and all the NPCs that are related to that quest will be in it the only downside of doing this is when you have a creature or an NPC or something like that that's involved in multiple quests. The problem comes in is that the blueprints uh, layout in Neverwinter Nights 2 doesn't allow you to have the same blueprint in multiple categories at the same time. So the approach that I took uh, is simply going to be if you edit or create a new quest, the last quest that you happen to edit or uh, create with an NPC in it is the is the cat classification that that NPC is going to end up in. So for example if I have quest number one with NPC Joe uh, when I hit finish on that you'll see NPC Joe uh, you'll see the NPC Joe under you know quest number one's name uh, in the blueprints. However if you create quest number two with a different name but you happen to use Joe as well and then you save it what'll happen is Joe will move from the blueprints category in quest number one and he'll be moved into quest number two. Uh, unfortunately it is, it's kind of like a side effect, there's nothing else I can really do about it. Um, I threw it out there but nobody seemed to have any better ideas. Uh, it is better than just having them all in one big giant list but it's not ideal so it's an option you can either turn it on or off and you can do it on just new items or you can do it on both or existing and new so it's up to you. I like turning it all on so it's all good. Uh, lastly, in the configuration, the next new thing is this quest ID start. I had a request that uh, um, was basically, how do I have multiple builders create quests for my world? And that was always a, a really challenging thing to do because unless you're allowing all your builders access to the same database, you know, this is, it's, it's pretty multi-user friendly, you know, it's just creating blueprints and things, um, but unless everybody had access to the same database, the, the ID numbers uh, you'd have a problem because you know builder one would build a quest and his ID would start at 1,000. Builder number two would have a quest and his ID would be 1,000. And all the components of the quest, the placeables, items, and, and creatures would all get tagged with that ID. And then of course if you try and merge them together, boom, bad things will happen. So the way it is now is you can actually specify the starting quest ID. Now this only is useful in an empty database, a brand new setup. So the technique is is if I have builder number one creating quests, I'll start him off at quest ID number 1000. And he's going to have a nice empty uh, table set in his. And even if they're sharing the database, this, this system will work. Uh, what you do is you have him start at quest ID 1000, and you actually let him have his own unique table prefix. You can call it leg quest, you know, underscore builder one, um, or, or whatever you want. And builder number two, he'll start off like quest ID number 2000. So each person can then build a thousand quests if they want. Um, and I, I know that sounds funny, but actually my world it's, has more than that, so uh, it's not uh, it's not unusual, or it's not out of this world to be able to have a lot of quests. But the point is, is that builder one builder one can have one thousand, builder two can have two thousand, and so on and so forth. They can each have their own table prefix if they're sharing a database, or you know it doesn't matter if they're using different databases. Uh, what'll happen then is whenever you start with that empty database, the very first quest ID is going to start at this number. So quest ID for builder one is going to start at 1,000. Quest ID for builder number two will start at 2,000. All the objects and placeables will be tagged with that quest ID. Then what you can do is you can simply export uh, all the leg underscore quest uh, tables from builder one or two and import them into like a master uh, database set wherever your module is really running. And um, because all of the quest IDs will be unique between them, there won't be any conflict. Uh, a couple of things that uh, you need to be aware of though, a couple of gotchas is, you really don't want to share NPCs when you have two builders building quests. They really should be using their own NPCs. And I don't mean that, I don't mean, uh, you know, use their own NPC blueprints, I mean, the Legends Quest plugin has the ability to have NPCs and the placeables and things involved in multiple quests. You can still continue to do that. However, if I have NPC Joe in my quest, the other builder probably shouldn't use NPC Joe as well because that can cause a conflict when you're doing an import. You know, who's got the who's got the proper NPC Joe? We don't know. So, it's best to keep your blueprints uh unique between the builders. Um that that'll work better. 
uh, and it's a lot easier to to combine them. So uh, again, all you do then is uh, each of builder will export uh, all of their blueprints, so all the blueprints that they create for their quests into a little ERF file, and they'll take a database dump um, of their uh, quests database, and then they can be merged together. Um, and there you go, and then you can have multiple builders building quests for, for one world. So that's what this is for. Uh, so I'm just going to click finish on this, and I'm going to quit, and what we're going to do is I'm going to stop the video here, because I'm, at a, I'm just past the 15 minute mark, and I'm trying to keep these videos manageably small in time. And uh, we'll move along into the next part, uh, and that is actually making some new quests and, and demonstrating some of the other new features of version 1.82. So we'll see you in a minute.